good morning everybody. Um, my, the title of my talk this morning is Buildings, Energy Use and Vertical Farming. Um, as an academic coming from the Department of Architecture and Building Environment, I almost feel as though I'm gate crushing this event, it seems to be called a scientist. But as uh, it was mentioned at the start, it is very much a multidisciplinary um, subject that requires expertise from business through to engineering through to architecture. So hopefully I can address some of the questions from a building's point of view but also raise a few questions as well. So we're looking at taking this forward as a research theme, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. You know, there's a large area of research that we believe that uh, we can look at going forward. Um, so in terms of buildings and energy use, you know, for the last 18 years I've been looking at this from a sustainable building design point of view, both in industry and academia. And one of the things I also take into studio with our students is I have a pet hate for greenwash. And <laughs> you might think, well, vertical farming, urban agriculture, plenty of schemes get put out there in the real world and also with our students as well, where you see green facades, green roofs, linking the farm with the urban environment. It looks great from a sustainability point of view. So I'm going to look at some of those questions today, but I want to start off with a pretty tongue-in-cheek um, little short clip, just to put it into perspective. So greenwash. Well, this is an advert for a hotel. Welcome to the Hans Brinker Budget Hotel, Amsterdam. When you check in, you're not just getting a night's sleep, you're helping the planet too. This eco-commitment begins in the lobby. To lessen our impact on the environment, Staff do as little as possible for guests. An eco-elevator ensures that the only energy spent going to the room is your own. Take a look around the Hans Brinker Eco Suite. To conserve space and energy, up to seven guests can sleep in a single room. Telephone and 24-hour room service, mini bar, satellite TV, just a few expenses our hotel is prepared to avoid to save our planet. Eco lighting, yet another feature. Every suite comes with a carbon neutral eco climate control system. It's also easy to use. Guest bathrooms are a celebration of cleanliness and eco friendliness. Refresh yourself with our range of eco toiletries and the eco shower. We also ask you, the guest, to help honor our eco commitment. Leave the towel on the rack. We won't wash it. Throw the towel on the floor. We still won't wash it. <laughs> Let's visit the bar, where a committed staff serves eco-drinks. After your drink, sample authentic eco-cuisine specialities. Or simply relax in our eco-courtyard. Solar heated when the sun is out. Additional amenities that have been disregarded in favor of the planet include state-of-the-art gymnasium and full-service spa. The Hans Brinker Budget Hotel is committed to doing as little as possible to accidentally help our planet as much as possible. Welcome to the Hans Brinker Budget Hotel, Amsterdam. Accidentally eco-friendly. Okay, just one example of eco Berlin. Um, I'm sure you're thinking, when I'm in Amsterdam next, so I must stay at that place. It looks, looks great, doesn't it? But um, coming back to today's theme then, um, vertical <coughs> farming, yes, it has a place, but it's important we don't add to an already uh, existing problem. And Dixon, in his uh, opening remarks in that short video, asked what building shape and form we should be looking at. And I think that's equally as important when we're looking at new build and also when we're looking at reusing the existing building stock as well. The other question he asked, him, asked was how to provide the lighting. You know, plants have developed over millennia to utilise natural daylight. Um, that's great, when chung asked me to be involved in this, and I thought of, well, what's the client? The client's the plants. The idea of uh, having, having clients that don't talk back to you if you get it wrong is, uh, was, was attractive. So, Move, moving forward then, what, how are we going to provide optimum lighting solutions now? We look at the energy balance, lighting is going to be one of those key issues that we need to address and it's going to be a focus of what I'm looking at um, in the presentation now. 
We don't want to add to the problem, so buildings at the moment are responsible for 40% of energy consumption and 36% of CO2 emissions across the European Union. So the thought of bringing plants into the built environment, potentially increasing that energy, is that something we want to be looking at? So how do we deliver that in a sustainable way? We're looking at the 1.8 million non-domestic buildings in the UK. So the UK stock already you can see of our existing buildings that heating and lighting is a large proportion of the energy used to provide comfort conditions for people within those spaces. And we're now going to move into talking about growing conditions for plants. We don't want to be adding to this already um, uh, frightening scenario. The same is true of our housing as well. You know, in 2010, domestic energy consumption was 32% of the UK's energy use. And actually looking at that, the appliance use, lights and appliance this value, is actually increasing. So we're spending more and more energy and lights and appliances within the domestic sector. Set aside that, we had some of the most stringent targets anywhere in the world. When it was first announced, the Code for Sustainable Homes, the delivery of zero carbon houses by 2016. Frightening thing for developers, a frightening thing for the big five house builders, to deliver a zero carbon house by 2016, completely turn the design situation on its head. So how could we do that? It's at the moment under review in terms of the, the definition of, of, of that, looking to be watered down fairly substantially, but we're still looking at very stringent targets for new build and for retrofit and zero carbon non by 2018. So if we were to bring farming into our cities, how do we do that in a sustainable way? So these are some of the questions I'd like everyone to think about today and maybe when we come back to the Q&A at the end of the day as well, just think about that as an issue. So looking at the world greenhouse gas emissions flowcharts, well buildings, we know a substantial proportion of that, looking at agriculture down here, and then the small amount that really goes into this carbon dioxide emission and related energy use in terms of food production at the moment. So shifting that into the built space, again we need to address how we can do that sustainably. We already have schemes and incentives in place in terms of CO2 food labelling, maybe pushing consumer choice as well, but ultimately we need to bring the CO2 associated with our, with our food down. You know, potential for reducing food miles by bringing crops into the cities. And maybe again, I personally think this again is a bit of eco bling. Anything with a wind turbine on a building was a, it was really very much in vogue several years ago. But the vertical farm, how we can deliver our on-site generation to, to offset the uh, energy requirements in there. So that's from a new build. From a new board point of view, you've almost got a blank palette. So the form, shape of your building could be dictated by the client's need, in this case, plants, so you can come up with the most appropriate solutions. The other thing we have in the UK is we have a large proportion of buildings that stand empty at the moment. 720,000 empty homes currently empty across the UK. Could this be a solution, utilising those buildings within our cities? and uh, constructing vertical farms. So much harder to do in terms of how we supply those with, with energy. Nottingham is now apparently the second worst um, large centre in the country for vacant retail premises. A huge amount of empty retail space that we've been told about in the news recently so, um, in, here in Nottingham. And then empty property industrial. So if you look at uh, vertical farms uh, in terms of building reuse around the world at the moment, these types of buildings lend themselves well for various reasons. I'll come back to this. This is part of a, a Riverside regeneration project that's going to move forward in Nottingham. And uh, we've been working with a developer um, through a student project looking at design solutions. I think some of the students are actually in, in the audience here today as well. Um, how this site could be regenerated. And one of the propositions I've put to them is let's use this particular building or one of the buildings as maybe a vertical farm that can feed the community, provide food for the restaurants and shops in that space. So retrofitting warehouses, because they're constructed to keep temperatures within certain levels. Massive buildings, large open spaces, big potential potentially to, to regenerate those and use them for urban farming within our city boundaries. Talking about city boundaries, so I was, I was struck by, um, probably about eight years ago now, to put a group of students out to Havana working with the School of Architecture there on a number of different projects, but I was struck by the amount of urban farming that was present within the city boundaries of Havana. So 50% of Havana's first produce is now grown within the city limits. <coughs> so that was pushed forward by the trade embargoes and the collapse of, of the Soviet bloc. They had to come up with a solution to be self-sufficient. 
and you saw these gardens cropping up all over the place um, within the city boundaries. And even here in Nottingham, we have um, a strong legacy of allotment <coughs> type complexes within the city boundaries and our, our urban farm, Stonebridge City Farm. So there's a wealth of expertise there. There is a, there's a, a feeling and a growing movement and uh, I think we should bring on board those um, key players in terms of things we move forward with. So from an architect's point of view, you often see, so just running through some of the, the key <coughs> players in this area, the, the, the famous TED talk, William McDonough's Cradle to, to Cradle Design um, lecture. So his proposition for a, a city in China, so this is what he showed us the existing situation, and then what he proposed. So in reality, looking very, very similar. The proposition to bring the farm up onto the roof of all the buildings and have vertical farming, urban agriculture on the extremities, on the exteriors of the building. So looking at two different scenarios where you look at <coughs> urban farming on the roofs and facades and then vertical farming technologies where it's very intense within the buildings itself. This was a comment that was, was next day. If anyone has trouble with the concept of design humility, reflect on how on, on this. It took us 5,000 years to put the wheels on our luggage. So something as very simple as that. So growing foods, you know, one of mankind's basic requirements. How can we change that and do it differently? So these are again some of the questions we, we need to ask ourselves. Some of the leading um, architects in this area from a um, green facade and green roof perspective, the green skyscraper book, an eco-architecture by Ken Yang and many of you may have may know of, of, of Kenji, uh, Ken Yang's work and the integration into the urban space. Famous um, Hector Forum, Green Wall by Patrick Blanc in Madrid. So a very iconic image. Again, not vertical farming, but the greening of our facades and bringing, bringing biodiversity <laughs> into, the, into the built environment. And then some of the schemes that have been put forward but not being, not being built. So, maybe wacky design concepts. So this is New York architectural firm, uh, work architecture company proposal for an urban farm apartment building in the center of New York. So is this necessarily the way we should be, should be going? And then more recently, future arch architectural plan of New York. So turning New York green, this is in Architecture Source Australia, just on the 19th of April of this year. So this proposal to, to green New York, so proposed urban farms will lie in major public areas such as the Brooklyn Bridge to provide the food demands of the 8 million city siders. So where do they get these stats and figures from? Is it, is it possible to achieve this within the city boundaries and what technologies and solutions will be used in order to do that? There was a lot of people that almost <coughs> fought against this and said, well, why is every scheme we see tends to be greened up and, and so has this eco bling all over it? And, and there was this article in... Um, in detail daily back in January where the title is Vegetables Fight Back. So there's a group in France, the Agricultural Urbanism Lab, was created just in 2012. So another, another movement in trying to push this agenda forward. Architects, plant scientists and landscape architects working together. And some of the images I've put in, put in the presentation here just to give you an idea of, of what they're proposing. So growing towers in the cities, urban allotments. So having these urban allotments within our cityscape. So Visually very nice, but does it does it work in reality? So we'll hear more and more about this as we go through the, the course of today. But a great concept, having the supermarkets below the produce, so live and grow units with vertical farming, integrated grocery stores, people living in the same space where the food is being grown. And then growing crops without sun and soil, this is a, another article in, in Discovery News, so verdant earth technologies planted retrofit to standard shipping containers. So again, the, how much artificial light is needed, how much energy is needed to, to, to grow this amount of produce within, within these um, customised containers. So, anything is possible. So we've seen these propositions and how can we actually achieve those in reality? So going back to Dixon's question at the start of today, what building shape or form? And it's one of the questions we set one of the master's students who worked on this as a small project over last summer along with how to provide the lighting. So we're going to look at the different types of lighting. I just want to run through, run through his work. Now, from a building design point of view, you typically look at energy flows in, energy flows out, and the comfort conditions that are required within there. In this case, it's going to be for, for our, um, our plants going in there. So the key issues that need to be covered, 
um, lighting the amount and type, temperature, humidity regulation, food and water, and potentially soil to support the plant growth and energy use and supply. So how are we going to provide all of these elements within a built environment space? Another example, so this is Mithen's Centre for Urban Agriculture. Um, their their uh, proposal for downtown Seattle was to incorporate more than an acre of native habitat farmland to the building's 0.72 acre site. And lots of, lots of figures, I'm not, you know, obviously there's some calculation behind this, but showing nice energy balance, increased biodiversity. And it struck me that it may be slightly flawed. I mean, this is a project that hasn't, hasn't been produced yet, but all of the energy requirement um, was coming from this solar photovoltaic array on the south facing facade. So blocking out any direct sunlight within that space, all the plants growing on the north side. Is this necessarily the right way we need to go? Yes, we're generating electricity providers with artificial light, but should this be a, a design consideration that potentially we need to avoid? Maybe this example from the Australian architect, uh, Rowan Fernando, submitted in the 2010 skyscraper competition, so where effectively using open space to provide ventilation, provide daylight, natural daylight, natural resources into those urban farming and vertical farming solutions. So that moves me on to some analysis that one of our students did. He wanted to look at natural light penetration of the buildings, the penetration depth and facade, arrangement of plants inside, the use of technologies to provide light deeper into the building, and then the, looking at the available technologies, technologies, the pros and cons, and there's people here that are exhibiting outside, and I'm sure they'll be able to talk you through some of those technologies um, during the course of the day. And then a case study. So that link up with the, the, the riverside regeneration. So from a design point of view, while we're very much used to doing lighting studies, solar analysis, using modeling tools to optimize the internal spaces of our buildings, so how could that potentially be applied to to deciding on the shape and, shape and form of our internal spaces to grow our plants. So direct light reaches about the depth equal to the facade height. So here you can see three different geometries put in, put into this space and just looking, as, if you're not familiar with these types of things, the amounts penetration is, the, the yellow colour is obviously better than getting the blue colour. So we're trying to optimise the daylight into the building to, to reduce the amount of artificial light requirement which has an energy penalty associated with it, using natural daylight. So which shape and form is potentially going to be best to do that? Obviously, same with offices. You know, deep plan offices require much more art artificial light. So a similar type of scenario with our, with our plants. Then looking at how we stack our plants, a different stacking. So we've simulated this in a very rudimentary way, actually. There was, no, there was no plant type shape we could put in there. So we had to come up with the best solution to try and look at staggering these situations in different formats to look at how that impacts on the amount of solar penetration into those spaces to optimise how we stack the plants in the space. Again, light penetrates almost the same depth, so you can see there's some diffuse radiation getting round the back of these, but it gives us an idea in terms of how we stack things and how we partition the plants off within the, within the spaces. Deep room, plant position, variation, no light, directing technologies, full south facade. So we simulated light directing technologies, so the use of light pipes and fiber optics potentially bringing space down into those deeper facades within this system. So light penetration models have increased the amount of daylight down into the space to increase the, the, the plant growth within there. Stacking plants as pillars is better for optimal light penetration. So this first case here with the stack, stacking of plants, it gives us an idea, just very roughly at the design stage, what building shape and form, but also how we stack the plants within those spaces to optimize our lighting. How we bring the light down into those deeper spaces within our buildings, so again looking at technologies that are used already in our buildings, the so sun pipes, light pipes, bulky cheap, limited bending capability, so in terms of light pipe technology you're talking about large diameter pipes, I think we have an example out here, internal reflectance from a highly reflective internal surface, bringing light down into the internal spaces. Full spectrum wavelength, self um, installment possible, 5 to 6% losses per meter, 15% losses across a curve. So some of the limiting factors potentially with light pipe technology. Light rods less bulky, I've got some images coming up on the next slide. More efficient in short length, full spectrum wavelength, again in terms of transfer, possibly to release light along the, the body. Now this is something that we've 
looked at in terms of going back to this modeling, one of the important things is that we have side emitting technology as well. So as we bring the light down, we get diffuse light around the plant. So we're not just lighting from above or beneath, but we also have light penetrating the plants as we come down through the stacks. So technology that can deliver that is of, of, of key importance. Fiber optics, slim, fully bendable, full spectrum wavelength, artificial light integrated. So again, with these technologies, the capability to integrate artificial light into the daylighting technology will be a, a plus. And then 50% so losses 30, every 30 kilometers can release light along the, the, the body side emitting. And then <coughs> light shelves, potentially integrating light shelves onto the facade to bring light deeper into the building. So images of light pipes, so effectively have the light coming down, internal reflection down into the internal spaces. And here you can see internally some imagery showing the light pipes bringing light into the room. And fiber optics, maybe with tracking technology to track the sun during the day so we can focus light down into these spaces. So again, bringing light down into deep spaces. Other technologies, some mirrors or light rods, so effectively solid acrylic rods bringing light through, or maybe light shelves on the, on the facades of buildings internally or externally to reflect light into the internal space, bouncing off the ceiling. So fairly simple technologies. Of the ones that Yanis reviewed, he put forward the proposition that maybe the best choice is, is fiber optics. Now this might not necessarily be the case, and probably other technologies are equally as good, but they can, they have, can travel over long distances, they're bendable and slim, so they can be utilized throughout their buildings, can go through walls, potentially have sun tracking technology and potential for spreading light along its path. Now some work by Kusai, the use of diffuse optical fibers for plant lights in this paper here, they were suggesting this as a, a potential technology, this diffuse optical fiber, where we have this side emitting capability to overcome this issue of just lighting from above and below and seeing the advantages that were um, mentioned in this particular publication. Enhanced space utilization, increased ratio of light energy received by the plants, increased leaf area exposure to light, reduced cooling loads and reduced air temperatures. So I'm gonna finish then with the case study that Yanis looked at. So this is, if you're familiar with Nottingham, this is the River Trent to the south of the Nottingham city centre. So again, this area is largely industrial. Some of this area here is, is pretty much industrial wasteland at the moment. And the development boundary we're talking about is this area here. So the next few years, we'll see this is a regeneration site in Nottingham <coughs> around the riverside water basin here. So already the developers are working up along with solutions to this. The particular building we thought we might address is this one here. Now the developer at the moment is in two minds as to whether this building has value, do we knock it down, or do we reuse it? So I put forward the proposition, maybe we reuse it and try and invigorate some thought, some thought of community around this particular space with our food growing. So here you can see the building, it's an old industrial grain warehouse right on the river, Great location, high, retail, uh, high um, property value, which I think is probably at the back of the developer's mind in terms of how they, how they can move that forward in terms of sales. But this is probably the best location. Low floor to ceiling heights as well make it very <coughs> difficult to, to utilize this because it was a grain warehouse. Incredibly massive as a structure as well. So from a, from a temperature regulation point of view, high thermal mass, good capability to do that. No windows on the original structure, see, no windows on the south facade. So, you know, where we want the light in, and then this, this barrel roof across the top there. So our, our proposal was to follow the aesthetic round onto the south facade, continue those windows round, and then take away, take away the roof, and maybe glaze that so we can have a vertical farming <coughs> technology in the top um, two floors of the building, and then with our windows wrapping all the way around onto the south facade to keep the character of the building itself, and then restaurant and retail area on the ground floor with our urban agriculture happening on the floors above, and here you see a nice out, outside space. Um, utilizing this collector area to bring daylight in through our fiber optic solutions into the, into the building itself. So of course, we need to then model that and potentially look at the best solutions for that. So here you can see our urban, urban vertical farming plant stacks that are put into this space here. And then a similar thing, looking at different <coughs> scenarios in terms of how we treat the facade, how we treat that roof area from, with different glazing solutions, 
maybe looking outside ETFE solutions as well um, in terms of modern materials moving forward. So looking at simulation to optimize our daylighting and try and reduce the amount of energy use from artificial light within those internal spaces and then bring in the, the, the plant structures themselves and you see the drop off in, in, in radiation around that. So how do we then bring the, the light down through the plant stacks? It's one of, one of the key issues we were looking at and trying to address with some of our simulation and some of our, our design solutions for this particular um, scenario where we're looking at this regenerated space. So again, using these design tools to then take it forward to look at how much of the plant requirements energy from sunlight could be delivered with our solutions and how much energy then would be required to top it up from artificial lighting solutions and more of this is in, in the piece of work that uh, Jan has produced at the end of it. So to conclude then with this nice image of uh, artificial light use within this, um, within this plant growing space, plants requirement for light is enormous and proper design to utilise as much as possible the free energy from the sun should be a key design parameter before we turn to other sources of energy to, to cover this requirement. This is, this is something that um, we're, we're saying from a design point of view and we believe in. So we need to come up with a requirement for daylight simulation models with closer uh, models, closer to plant geometry and appropriate design daylight spectrums that in terms of plant growth, um, putting those into our models and hopefully come up with some design guidelines for how we can optimise our new buildings and how we can optimise and reuse our existing building stock. And I'm finishing with this slide. So, seven years ago, our students designed and built a zero carbon solar powered house, and we took it to an international competition in Madrid. And Phil, I don't know if he's in the room, but Phil worked with us on the solution for the courtyard because one of the things the students wanted in this project was an urban food garden. So, we had a growing space in the house. By the way, they designed and built this. We had to build this two story house in seven days in Madrid, so a group of students who had never built a house before. Um, so this, and not only that, it was in another country, working with Spanish um, contractors. It was a, I won't do it again, it was a hell of a job to, to, to manage. But what we wanted to do in this space is come up with this growing courtyard, and uh, it was the first installation to use a new material, so it utilised an infrared barrier ETFE solution. And you can actually feel the difference. So when we built this house, it was about seven degrees at night, going through the we had the worst rain in Madrid for 50 years when we were building it and we were flooded and it caused all kinds of problems during the construction phase. During the competition, the temperature in there got up, up to, the temperature of the site was over 40 degrees. <coughs> and we used evaporative cooling technologies inside developed by um, a colleague in our, in our department here in Nottingham to keep the temperature regulated in there. But it was amazing to me with direct solar radiation onto this. People walking through, you had queues of people coming in to have a look around this. As you walk behind this barrier, you could feel the drop in temperature. You could feel the ETFE screen working. So I put that up there just as, I know we've got some ETFE on display outside, but again, we need to be potentially looking at different materials and new materials when we're looking at this concept of uh, vertical farming with, in the urban space. Thank you very much. That was yeah. Time for one quick question if anybody wants to fire away. Yes, please. Hi, um, Phil Watts from Next Toys. Um, I've, I've taken by a brief comment at the beginning, and I thought the hotel you offered did specifically avoid the greenwash, and I thought it was an excellent example of how development, the need for development, is against uh, um, all of our uh, things. So the trick is to try and achieve all of those luxuries as with as little uh, as possible. Now, but my main point was, I think there's, there's a real combination of building science, under building science as an engineer, um, finding out about plant science. And <coughs> there's a real fundamental that plants need a lot of magnitude more light than humans do. Yep. Um, now, a human might be happy in, what? This is 100 lux here. You won't get any growth with 100 lux. You really need 10,000. Now, the other point is that moving light around, I know, is a real pain in the neck. It's really impossible to do. So I would say that the idea behind this thinking is to use the surplus light that we can't get into the middle of the building for use by humans to be used by plants. So the idea of filling the building with plants, multi-story, 
seems um, inappropriate. Whereas no. the, the, the surface that you don't need for windows to bring daylight in in an appropriate manner, because you can't use all of it, is what we're talking about. Absolutely. So part, part of the reason I said at the start was to raise more questions than, than the answers being put forward. So it's, it's good to hear your, your views on that. And I think it's something that's a, yeah, a real value and something we should take forward. Question at the um, it's, it's actually slightly perhaps as a question. I'd really like to second what that gentleman just said. I, I think it's a, really a lot to be looked at what he's just said there. It's very true. But uh, one thing with getting light into the building, what confuses me at the moment is uh, there are some wonderful distribution systems that are now available and uh, uh, they don't seem to be looked at or used there. The emphasis seems to be of distributing light through solid core systems such as fiber optic and I, I cannot understand for the life of me why they're not developing hollow type systems for photon goes through gas a lot quicker than it goes through a solid. There's a lot less energy there. And why are we using photovoltaic panels to collect the energy, which can't operate much more than 11 percent efficiency, when a plant is a lot more efficient way of collecting that energy. Well, it's a the photosynthesis is so much more efficient at the collecting energy from the sun than any photovoltaic uh, uh, panel is. So it, 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 the way that you use the things that you want to put in your building on the outside of your building, you've got an incredibly energy efficient conversion from sunlight into energy, and it, 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 that part just seems to be forgotten about. And bear in mind <coughs> one of those schemes there replaced the south facade with PV and then put the plants on, on, the, on the back. But part of the reason for this talk was to pull up some contentious issues and slides, and I'm, I'm glad to see there is some debate being formed around it, and there's opportunity later um, when, when all the speakers will be together to, to hopefully take that forward. All right, I, don't, I can see there's lots of people want to ask Mark, I promise he's going to be here at lunchtime so you can snap it in there, but we need to. Otherwise, I'll be beaten up to everybody starting today. Um, so we'll stop and hand over to.